Welcome to the Evolution Learning Show, a podcast focused on deep and real conversations with everyday students and the road towards independence. We all want to live a life with a purpose, not just any life, but our own life. And here's your host, co-founder of Evolution Learning, Sam Kwong. Hey everybody, Sam Kwong here and welcome back to another episode. In this session, Mark Seguin and I discuss what it takes to hustle and be financially independent so that you can satisfy your passion, goals, and obligations. Mark is born into a family of engineers. However, he took the path less traveled and decided to embark on his passion for studying business analytics. Mark shares how importantly family has been to the success that he has to date and cannot thank his two brothers, mom and dad enough for setting him up with core values and principles. Financial obligation was a core concept and value that we discussed as he learned that very early from his family and uses this to make logical and effective decisions. Mark joined the Evolution Learning community in 2018 and is a machine. He works for what he has and has been employed at over five different companies and has learned at a young age that you reap what you sow and working hard is part of his recipe. If you want to learn more about the tips and tricks that Mark shares, this is the episode to tune into. Follow and subscribe to our channel for weekly content. For now, sit back and enjoy the show. Three, two, one. Hey, today, super, super excited. So we have Mark Seguin here today. So Mark has been with Evolution Learning for about a year and a half now. Mark, I'm super excited to have you. You've kind of crushed it. Um, you know, a lot of parents are raving about you these days. And you've been, you know, a tutor mentor for us where, you know, I really deeply do want to thank you. Um, you've contributed a lot to our community. And now you're here now um, on a podcast to really help out our community. How's it going? It's going great, man. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the splendid introduction. You know, it's, uh, I was really excited when I got the message. It was like, hey, want to be on the pod? And that's always something I've wanted to do. So to be here now, talk back on... Uh, some of the experiences uh, it's it's pretty exciting you know and it's it's been a blast being part of the evolution uh, family for the past year and a half now and uh looking forward to a few more years of that sure thank you thank you mark hey i thought you were going to reject me hey and then you you got back right away and i was like what <laughs> yeah no it was it was you know it was a pretty good opportunity at the time you know i uh, some people you know because when you go to a networking event the thing they always tell you is one, don't ask for a job, and two, they won't offer you a job. I met you, and it was kind of like a job offer, sort of conversation starting the job offer, and everyone's like, well, no, they don't do that at networking events. I was like, you know what? I'm going to take it, and uh, I don't regret it at all. Looking back, it was one of the better decisions I've made. Yeah. No, you, <laughs> you're bringing back some memories. I remember that. That was at the University of Calgary in what, I believe it was the end of 2018 or the beginning of 2019, right? Beginning of 2019, I think. Yeah, it was, it, they throw, uh, that school of, uh, Haskane School of Business throws a pretty good uh, networking mixer every year, networking unplugged. And uh, yeah, I bumped into you there. You were mm-hmm. one of the, uh, the companies that came out. Mm-hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah. And hey, that's how we met. And um, I guess here's the thing, Mark, the stars aligned. And going back to my memory now, I just remember very vividly, um, you were in your first year of university. But when we were talking, I felt like your maturity level, here's the thing, I'll be very honest, I was thinking back when I was in first year. And I was like, why am I not like Mark Seguin? You know, (laughs) those are, I'm being very honest, those are my initial thoughts, right? And I was like, why am I not like this guy? You were, you know, you were asking more questions, you know, trying to understand things and trying to learn. But I think above and beyond that, it was just more of your candor and the way that you were communicating and expressing yourself. I was like, wow, this guy wants to continuously learn and grow. And I think that's how we connected. And hence, that's essentially why um, I wanted to pick your brain here a little. Um, you know, I, here's, here's my personal belief. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. When you talk to someone, there's lots to learn. And I've learned a lot through, uh, from you from the last year and a half. And that's why I wanted to learn a little bit more, you know, from you. Whereas, you know, you came into university with that much maturity, but I want to go back a little here. I want to go back to like when you were growing up, call it, uni- uh, call it elementary, call it high school, call it junior high. You know, what 
who is Mark Seguin? What was he like? Interests, hobbies, you know, family, you know, what, who's, who, who's Mark, who's the real Mark Seguin, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I grew up, uh, born and raised in Calgary, been uh, here my whole life, 20 years, never moved once. So I've been out of the West, uh, Calgary there. Uh, so growing up, uh, fun fact is I actually did uh, my entire education in French immersion. Oh. So I'm uh, fluent in French. I'm bilingual. Um, it's, you know, pretty cool. Uh, I come from a pretty French family and then uh, sort of the way cultural things were moving in the 20th century. Um, most of my aunts and uncles and my, including both my parents, uh, lost touch with the language, but both my parents thought, you know, that's something that's important. Uh, you know, it, it definitely has opened a lot of opportunities for me in terms of career wise, in terms of education. So I'm grateful they did. Uh, so the first six years at Hoi Name out in Killarney, uh, Mm -hmm. You know, really big into basketball in the early years of my life. Um, you know, I play basketball and soccer now. Uh, soccer, I picked up a bit later in high school, but basketball was definitely my thing, you know, through junior high as well, playing, uh, playing on the basketball team in school was some of the fondest memories I had. Uh, you know, I, uh, being on the west end of Calgary, it's, it's pretty quick out to the mountains. So as well, during the winters in Calgary, you know, Kind of sounds strange to say, but I actually enjoyed the winters a lot, uh, you know, despite how, how bad the roads got, just because being able to get out to Kananask to do some skiing was, was always the best. Um, you know, I, I grew up with uh, two older brothers, so we're all two years apart. So, uh, you know, that was really nice always to have kind of friends in the family. You know, you didn't have to go over to a friend's house to hang out with someone that was cool. Um, you know, so to this day, we're still really close and I'm incredibly blessed in that mm -hmm. regard. Um, you know, moving on sort of to the high school years, I did um, all three years at St. Mary's uh, High School downtown. Mm. So continuing with French, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty fun. I, I played uh, a bit of volleyball, a bit of basketball in the first two years, but uh, I decided in grade 11 uh, to sort of switch the gears, put the focus more so on the academic side of things. And so uh, from there, I mean, as, as we've said, I uh, sort of made the commitment to take the right courses I needed to get into business. So right away, sort of in high school, I think what helped me out the most was having a clear goal of, of what the end goal for post-secondary was. And, uh, you know, a few years later, here I am going into my third year of uh, business analytics degree. Wow. Wow. No, it's, you know, as you're telling that story, there's a lot of things that came to mind. And I think the first thing was, you, you seemed like you transitioned from, you know, this Mr. Athletic, right, where you were interested in all these sports, right, just getting out yeah. there and team sports, right. Um, and then going into, you know, the education side where you had this pivot, or you had this switch where you're like, hey, I went from sports to academics. And I only, you know, bring this up now, because I remember younger where a lot of, you know, a lot of my friends are like, Oh, am I going to, you know, go into sports and do that professionally? Or am I going to, you know, go into academia? Right. But, you know, as you were describing it, it seemed almost effortless, but I'm, I'm sure that there was, you know, some roadblocks and some bumps along the way. So I guess going back to that junior high Mark Seguin um, or high school Mark Seguin, did you always know that you were going to go into business or like, how you know how did this all come about um so so really that decision uh i would say it was incepted sort of probably probably 10th grade and then sort of going into the 11th grade uh looking at options i had to take that's when i had to really solidify it uh i come from a family actually uh, quite a few engineers in the family especially on my mom's side my grandfather uh really early pressures on the, yeah you know the, the engineers are just like that you know they want to they always want to recruit more of them so, yeah. so that was that was something as yeah. sort of career options um my dad's a computer programmer my mom's a dietitian mm -hmm. um you know at the time neither really appealed to me and then mm -hmm. pressure from an engineer those were sort of the career paths I sort of saw as, as very feasible. Uh, my brother, my oldest brother, he ended up pursuing computer science. Uh, for me, I was more so into people interfacing. So technology at the time uh, wasn't really something I wanted to pursue. And then mm. the, the middle brother, so I'm actually the youngest, uh, he went, ended up uh, succumbing to the pressure. He, uh, <laughs> he went to engineering at the UFC. So I sort of saw what he was going through and sort of actually it went from a word to actually what the projects would entail. And it was, it was the same with computer science. 
you know, right. being able to, to, to relate with my brothers, what they're going, it kind of gave me an understanding. Uh, and so really what it was is just sort of sitting down and saying, I don't really have a clear idea of what I want to do, but as opposed to some of my peers who were just sort of saying, yeah, I'll, I'll figure out in grade 11, I'll figure out in grade 12. You know, at that point I was realizing that, you know, it would probably make it a lot more difficult with my school schedule, getting to the right courses, cause you know, with the sciences and everything, some programs are specific. So I, I sort of thought I might not have it all pinned down to exactly, you know, which discipline I want to go into, but I think I have a general understanding of the kind of work I do. Um, working with people, I think, uh, in a professional sense, most closely aligned with business. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, while my brother was doing some, his sort of uh, intro to uh, engineering, I went to one or two campus events just to kind of check things out. You know, seeing business, they give me a pamphlet and there's like probably a good 23 different majors you can pursue. Uh, you know, don't quote me on that, but uh, there's definitely a lot. And so sort of seeing that, what I what, what was put into my head is that you don't necessarily have to know right now exactly which one of, of the many you want to go into. Um, but sort of having that commitment, having something, you know, the place you want to go. It's not just, I want to go to post-secondary. It's I want to get into the business program from there. What, you know, once you get in, once you secure that, you can start to, and especially once you matured then at first year or 12th grade sort of picking majors and whatnot from there, you can just, and you understand yourself better it's not as much pressure being put on the 10th grader so mm -hmm. for me what it was is just kind of picking something that i could grow into something that i knew generally i would probably enjoy and then once i had refined my interest sort mm -hmm. of seen a bit more of the world seen you know careers different options then i could specifically sort of start to start a career path in business Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it seems like from what i heard there like you were really trying to funnel it down but you're like hey what's the, you know, what's the major thing I have to decide right now? It's like where I want to go and what major I want to be a part of. And like the, you know, the minor stuff after like what you're going to major in and minor in, you know, that stuff's later. Right. But um, yeah. I'm actually curious, Mark, when you told your parents, oh, I, what, well, before I get here, I, I love how you taste tested. It's almost like you sampled, you knew that, you know, your brother, and it seems like you guys have a pretty close relationship. So we kudos do, for indeed. that. Yeah. Um, but you guys, you were able to, you know, taste test, right. But I'm actually going back to the question I was about to just ask you here, which was, you know, what did your parents think when you're like, Hey, I'm not going to be an engineer. And the only reason why I asked this question is because, you know, I want to be careful when I say this, right? Like most parents, most parents want you to become what they are or they want you to become what they were not you right yeah you know what i'm saying yeah i know I, I it's like i never had this and i want you to have this so become this because i'm working so hard to give you this yeah so you could have this but that's why i'm going back with this question where i'm like hey like how how were they were they okay with it were they disappointed did you know real yeah, talk no. <laughs> so i mean real talk uh it was always known i mean from a young age sort of the way we were raised uh, is they really put the onus on on fiscal responsibility. So earning your, whether it was allowance, whether it was working a part-time job, earning and saving money, being fiscally responsible. And we knew that we were going to have to pay our tuition. And so it's sort of, you know, I don't want, their notion was, I don't want to pay very expensive tuition for you to go into something that you don't necessarily want to do. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to necessarily go into post-secondary. You have the freedom to make the choice, but, you know, you're going to have to pay for whatever you want to do. You want to go away for school, live on res. That is completely fine. Just know that's now an additional cost you're adding. Mm -hmm. So for me, really what it was is uh, they were never, they were never super on the engineer rah-rah team. You know, that was yeah. mostly, mostly coming from, well, my grandfather and, and my, my older brother. Um, yeah. But for them, you know, they really supported the decision and, not just the decision, but the logic behind the decision of picking business is something that was broad, but not too broad. You know, it's, it still had good career opportunities, mm -hmm. but sort of something you need just getting the foot in the door. Cause for them, the focus wasn't really, uh, you know, what school are you going to go to? What program is mm -hmm. program, but you know, their focus was in here in the now one, you can't get into that program. Honestly, if you don't get the high school courses done, if you don't pull the grades you need, and 
you know, I really thank them for this, but they really put the pressure on the early admission system. Mm. So uh, for some people that might not be familiar, essentially it's a way to secure your spot in a certain program earlier uh, by applying with your grade 11 marks. So whereas a lot of students really don't start to put the pressure on themselves for mark performance until the 12th year when that would be their admissions marks, uh, they, they put the, the emphasis and the importance early on. It was, you know, you can have the peace of mind knowing earlier in the year um, that you got in or, you know, if it gets more competitive and, and you miss out, um, that's not something you have to worry uh, as much with if you do the early admissions. So from there, it was important for me just to understand, okay, get the foot in the door, but really they just wanted really whatever I was going to do, do it properly and be successful. So I, you know, I'm, I'm really thankful for my parents. They were really supportive in, in my high school journey. Um, I'll be honest. I, uh, I was the kind of kid who never fully developed proper study habits. So to transition, uh, you know, to, to courses now that I actually had to pull the good grades, um, you know, to, to stay on top of things. Cause before it was just a matter of obtaining good grades by sort of immersing yourself in the subject, trying to learn as much as you could. Um, and then, you know, for the most part that worked, but you know, sometimes you did hit it off on a test where you maybe should have studied. Yeah. Um, but you know, when you get to the point where you now want to use these marks for admissions, um, you needed consistency across the board. So really what it was for them, what they were more so focused on is, developing those study habits because mm -hmm. then whether I went into engineering, computer sciences, health sciences, whatever it be, if, you know, even if I got the marks to get into there, they just knew if you didn't have the work ethic and the study habits, mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't be of any success. So it was kind of for them is have a vision, have something realistic and then, okay, what's the procedure, the process to get to that. That is so beautiful. Like Mark went, I, I've never met your parents before and I really want to because I feel yeah. like they are freaking awesome. And when I say that, there's an underlying message here. And the underlying message is that when I heard that they said, hey, Mark and your two other brothers, you can make whatever decision you want. But what I loved was the fiscal responsibility aspect of it. it it's almost like, hey, you know, if you're going to fall, pick yourself back up but just know that hey there's you know fiscal responsibility that there's going to be loans there's going to be debt and they're they're almost showing you a little bit about how life actually works instead of covering yeah, it up yeah. for you you know what i mean is that true yeah well so what i found with in in terms of the aspect of fiscal responsibility mm -hmm. uh at the time as a kid i mean you you see uh I mean, I don't want to throw them under the bus, say they didn't buy me things, but general like toys and stuff, you know, birthdays, Christmas, uh, I, you, you'd get gifts and whatnot. But if let's say there's a new Xbox game or, or whatever, right. I can just, Hey, can we go to the store and get that out? I was always a, a firm no. Uh, and, and so to see, <laughs> yeah. to, see, to, see yeah. uh, to see my peers, you know, sort of get what they want, you know, at the time it was just kind of disheartening, but what actually, even as a kid, this, this is where I, I sort of had to come to accept it is I could just see the payoff in, in terms of how you value things if you have to earn the money to buy it, right? So as opposed to just having something bought for you versus saving up your allowance, right? Again, let's say, you know, there's a new video game. Okay, well, I'm, I'm a 12 year old. I don't really have uh, deep pockets. So it's like 35 bucks for this new uh, soccer video game or whatever. So I know now I got a, it's whatever, two and a half months of allowance or it's an odd job and a half um, helping out with uh, some big tasks around the house. So understanding like things in life, you can't just tap the card and, you know, it, right. You have to earn the money to get there. And I think then once you've earned the money, right. You know, you don't want to just go and, and buy something with extra features just, Oh, cause you know, it's only an extra 50 bucks, right. When it's your money, you're like, well, what do I, what, what was worth first off to spend my money on? Mm -hmm. And then sort of, what do I want to spend my money on? Right. And then mm -hmm. from there, I think you, you just value things a bit more. And as well, you know, in, in terms of um, structuring yourself to make big payments, like buying a car, paying for tuition, mm -hmm. right. The bigger things, not just the little things, right. Mm -hmm. You really, that, that kind of thing, it's not just, Oh, I need, I now need to pay for tuition. Okay. I'm just going to mm -hmm. work real quick and get, you know, eight, eight K out of nowhere. I mean, tuition's getting pricier and pricier every day. So yeah. I have the notion of every single time you take in money, set some aside, you know, you might, you might have, 
certain item you want to, you want to get right away and maybe you earn the money right away to get it. Yeah. But it's always setting something aside for later. Cause I mean, we see in COVID now, like the employment sort of landscape has, has definitely changed in what mm-hmm. I thought I would be making this, this summer as, as potentially a summer intern. Uh, if I had, you know, made purchases with the expectation that I'd have that money in my account, mm-hmm. uh, I would be in a very, very big trouble right now fiscally. Um, yeah. So it's just sort of having that reservation and, and sort of always having something, it's again, what you mentioned, something most important, a pocket to fall back on. Right. A lot of kids, uh, you know, it's like you can always indulge, you know, every single weekend in high school, there's always some way you can spend your money, whether it be going out for food, going out for the movies, mm-hmm. um, going to see a hockey game. But just really to, to have that and have my parents instill that for me on an early age, then, you know, it was, it was the understanding of why I'm doing it that sort of helped me carry through. Mark, your parents have taught you one of the best courses or life lessons ever. Yeah. And when I say this, you probably know this being a part of evolution learning, you probably heard me talk about it as well. But like the aspect of financial literacy, um, you know, yes, we do tutoring and mentorship. How does this all tie in? Well, as you may already know, it ties in because in high school, your decisions affect what happens in the later half of your life. Meaning that, you know, if you're in high school and you're just taking random university courses and you're like, hey, I'm going to try this out. Uh, I don't like it. I'm going to switch. I'm going to give this a try. Oh, I don't like education. I'll try engineering. I don't like engineering. I'm going to try business. I'm going to try pharmacy. And just take that back and divide that a bit, right? If it's just one time that you switch, let's say you switch in the second year, that's anywhere from twenty to $30,000, depending on if you live on campus or not right? And that's yeah. in Canada, it's already a blessing, right? If you're going to the US, oh, yeah. you could put oh. a multiplier of like 2.5. Yeah, it's on ridiculous. That number, it's right. You know, we're really blessed to be in Canada with the tuition prices we have. And but, it's still uh, expensive. Yeah, know? I know. It's, it's still it's, you know, it's, it's almost a full yeah. summer's worth of wages to just for yeah. a, a tuition or, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the year's worth of, of books. But uh, definitely to to sort of have like you're definitely right if you can sort of plan things out and avoid unnecessary costs it's it's why people say uh don't go into general studies if you don't know what you want to do out of high school work a year yeah put money in the bank as opposed to taking money out of the bank for something you may not even want to do and may not even become relevant to a career you're going to pursue Hey, we're we're gonna need, we're we're gonna definitely need Mr. and Mrs. Seguin here to teach some financial literacy because if they're on the show, they will definitely you know teach something that is so valuable. And the reason why I say that is because you know the debt that is instilled in a lot of the people here. And don't get me wrong, there's a lot of people left and right that are in debt, but yeah. educational debt is a a significant one as well. Like if you're if you're choosing around one or two different majors, you come out with thirty thousand dollars in debt. It's hard to climb out of that hole. Whereas if you go through something and that's why, you know, even at evolution learning, we try to, you know, help people so that when they graduate high school, they can choose something that not only they connect with right passion and purpose, but it's something where, you know, uh, case in point, like yourself, right, you chose something that is in your general sphere of interest, and that you know, that you can find a job work and hey, you're not going to like everything you do, but at no, least that's, you have that financial, you know, um, backing to be able yeah. to start from here and then you gravitate and you levitate to different platforms. Right. Which is amazing what you've done. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, uh, it's definitely something like, I think, uh, a big thing I want to touch on with what you just said there is mm-hmm. you're not always going to enjoy every single aspect of what you're doing. And I think a lot of kids, uh, are told pursue the career you love. If you have a passion, pursue that passion as a career. I'd say yes to a certain extent, right? I mean, I I love to shoot hoops. I tell you, but you'll never catch me uh, NBA, let alone NCAA. Like I just don't have the body yeah. for it, the athleticism, the talent, right? Yeah. Um. And so you know, and again, right? You know, you, you say uh, you know you really like uh, working with people, but you hate office work, you hate spreadsheets. Well, I, I hate to tell you, there's gonna be very few roles that pay really well that just have to deal with talking with people, right? It's always gonna be something, you know, 
there's always going to be drawbacks to every single job. I, I have yet to find the perfect job that has, has no sort of drawback in, in any regard. What it is, is, is pursuing something that, uh, first off, you, you can get good at because you generally enjoy what you're doing. Um, but it's just being content with the work you're doing. You're not always going to be happy. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's not something you're not always going to love to get up and go to your job. Um, but it's trying to find something that's, that's going to provide you with stability because day in, day out, you can go back to it and do it well. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of something a lot of kids, I think, need to hear when, when sort of picking majors is, uh, is you know, not just pursuing something. Uh, you know, a lot of arts and humanities are very appealing to, to high school students, um, you know, sort of pursuing anthropology and things like that. Uh, but then it's, you know, the realization if you actually want to get a job in, in some of those fields that a lot of it's like research internships. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's not doing that, that cool article dig right away. It's you're going to be slogging through a lot of research. And for mm -hmm. some kids and uh, university students, that's that's a major deterrent. Right. Mm -hmm. I think it's realizing you have to you have to find a passion, but as well being w willing to put in the work necessary to achieve that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And as you're saying that, Mark, you know what the fix is? The fix is that if all high school students can go through and just take a couple steps back, because they have, let's not discount the fact that they have so much stresses, anxieties, they got friends that they're building, exams that are coming around the corner. Here's the thing, like a high school student, and I'm just talking about myself when I was in high school. I'm thinking about, oh, do I want a boyfriend or a girlfriend? Do I want grades or math or like what, you know, subjects? And then at the dinner table, it's like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And it's like, whoa, well, do I have to decide that now? Or like, what's going on here, right? And then the pressures come in, right? And I guess what I'm trying to say here is that, you know, let's not discount the fact that yes, there's, you know, all those stresses and stuff. But however, if most high school students can just take a step back and take the emotions away from it and say, hey, don't get me wrong, if you want to go into an arts or humanities or engineering, or if you're like, you know what, I want to start my own business, right? Map out what that kind of looks like, because you can usually it's not going to be 100% what that roadmap looks like. But you can typically get it to 75%. Right. And what I mean by this is, you know, I'll, I'll share a little bit, you know, about my background. Right. So I went into accounting. Do I like accounting? No, not really. I was just telling myself, you know, don't get me wrong. There's a lot I learned, but I deep down, I, I don't look at myself as an accountant. I, I really liked education, but I didn't find that out until later. But going into accounting, I was like, hey, you know what? Yes, I might not like it. But I was more, more or less the same, same as you, Mark, where I had um, parents that, you know, they had four boys, right? So a family of six, like they're not going to be paying for a single dime for anything, right? And nor yeah. do I expect it, right? No, you, no, no. You'll all. be lucky if you got hot dogs for dinner, okay? <laughs> you know, that type of family. And so, you know, I, I go back to that. And I'm like, yes, I might not like accounting. But are there things that I can take from that and learn? It's almost like I looked at it as I was investing in myself for three or four years to get financial stability. And then after I would do what I love, right? Whereas sometimes it, you know, we're so young, right? What's four years, right? We got yeah. 60 left. Well, Mark, yeah. you got like 90 left, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> you're going to live to 120, okay, buddy? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I guess what I'm getting here, I think the the main point that i'm actually trying to make here is that if we all just kind of thought about it cuz here's the thing we can't we can't say oh what mark did it's the perfect formula now take that formula and do it cuz everyone no. is so different yeah right? it's it's mhm mm but i think if we were able to take a bit of that and say hey you know what before we make the decision what is that 80% going to look like right yeah. And that 20% is obviously there's always going to be risk with whatever you do. But if you're doing something that you're, that you're conscious of, I was going to use the wrong word because a lot of people are like, oh, do what you're passionate about. It's, it's almost like you got to do what you're conscious about and then the passion will come after you have stability. And yeah. so that never really came until after I was like, oh, hey, I got a job. And then it verified that, you know, when you get a job for a year or two and you do it, you know, you know if you like it right away right? Yeah. After a year, you're like, hey, am I really passionate about this? And the short answer is accounting for me, not really. But what I do like 
is a lot of the analytical aspects that you learned. But deep down, I wanted to be an educator. I wanted to help the, the future generation that was coming up, right? And so I, I knew that I didn't want to invest another four years into an education program. I'd, 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 I'd be not at 90, you know, like I, yeah. 10 years of education for me. I was like, no, not for me. But then I was like, how could I shortcut this? Right. And I was like, I really wanted the experience. Pay was like, whatever. Right. So I went over to Asia to teach for $12 an hour, $12 US. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so it, it was a huge pay cut. My mom was livid. Right. When I quit my job, because it was an she, she always calls it a nice job, you know, that office job yeah, when the cozy, you know, secure, the kosher job. Cool. And yeah, I quit that job for 12 bucks an hour. And, um, you know, it was wow. the best thing that I ever did. Cause it, you, you see evolution learning now it's, you know, it's kind of how it started. Right. I needed the experience, but I, it was almost like a calling. And I guess why I share this now is because sometimes you might not get into the program that you want right away. But if you have that financial stability, you can always gravitate, right? R rather than being in 50,000 in debt, wouldn't you rather 40,000 or 20,000 or even 10,000 where you're above water? And then you're like, you know what? Accounting or engineering or finance or whatever, right? Marketing is not for me. I'm going to switch here. But then you have yeah. that financial stability where you're not in debt. But I mean, to each their own, right? Yeah, no. So, I mean, I definitely, I, I really like what you said about sort of the 80 20 thing, but having some sort of, plan or something i mean obviously there's gonna be changing elements so like in your case right you, you know you you had the plan you followed all the steps and then the last 20 percent was turns out i don't really like accounting um i think though like you said about sort of the 40 30 20 underwater or being above water i, I think probably the most helpful tip i could give to anyone to try and avoid Know, sort of going well okay now i'm at a point where i've, I've done the program or i've gotten into the job i've progressed to the rank where this isn't aligning now with i want what i want to do with the rest of my life mm -hmm. is gain as much exposure to the world as possible and what i mean by that is is um i started working uh in junior high so my first job was as a referee i did soccer refereeing a bit in the spring and the summer mm -hmm. uh got my first full-time job uh working at a lumber yard uh, in the 10th grade and i worked part-time and full-time in summers through high school um to have that exposure to understand sort of mm -hmm. different types of people different work um just even the slightest exposure to what manual labor was actually like um right. i got the understanding I really don't want to do this for the rest of my life. It's, it's great to do now. It's great to be in the sun in the summer, but uh, you know, I, I want to have a career where I'm more so doing um, a bit more, you know, in an office uh, professional environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of, a lot of students, if, if they don't work, if they don't go and get those experiences with people, um, they don't have a great understanding of kind of what types of things they're good at and what they're not. Right. Right. I mean, some people like they'll think, Oh, I'll just, like a lot of students go into business having no customer service or retail experience and they actually find it challenging when it, when it comes time to, to work on projects, to do networking events and things like that because they don't have the social skills. And so then they're sort of in a bind because uh, you know, they, they're not comfortable in their environment. And you know, had they maybe gone and, and done a retail job prior, you know, maybe they would have developed the skills to enable them to pursue the dream or realize I, I really don't get on great with people. Uh, you know, I don't want to work in, you know, a people interfacing role. I'd rather do something more technical and they start mm -hmm. to look, it's about self discovery. Right. Uh, and that really only comes through taking opportunities. I mean, when I got into first year, uh, university, it was, I, I went into the general stream and, uh, in Haskane, the two really big ones are finance and accounting. Mm -hmm. Probably about, uh, you know, like 70% of all uh, people that declare a major will go into one of the two. Right. Um, you know, the very big, very stable. Uh, and so looking at that, I found what I thought to be a passion in marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I did, though, is instead of just signing myself up for a bunch of marketing courses, uh, potentially screwing up my schedule for a few semesters to come, is I got involved with a, a group called Prism Advertising. So uh, I took the leap to join a, a student club. Essentially what they do is they do uh, advertising and marketing services for yeah. uh, nonprofits, small businesses, things like that. And I did the work and I sort of got exposure to the industry. And I realized 
this isn't sust uh, a sustainable enough industry. Uh, right. And what I mean, not environmentally sustainable, but in terms of your job security, uh, they tend to have this attitude in marketing where it's phasing out the old in favor of the new. There's, there's not longevity in, in the industry. And so mm -hmm. I was like, okay, well, I mean, I still very much enjoy doing the marketing. It's something fun, something right. I, I maybe consider as a side hustle. But as, as, that, as that fiscal backing, as, as the pillar of the, the accounting job as it was for you, um, mm -hmm. that wouldn't be it is what I had to realize. So I sort of had to realign from there. And what it is is just constantly seeking new experiences to, mm -hmm. to gain more understanding of sort of how the world works. And from there, once you've experienced something, you have knowledge now to help your informed guesses. So then now we're sliding it from the 80-20 to maybe the 90-10. You can mm -hmm. gain more certainty, more clarity as to, okay, well, if, if I take these steps, what ideally would be the result that produces? Mm -hmm. And so I do definitely agree, though, sort of having financial backing, um, you know, in terms of a good example would be with your job, you get to the point where you're earning a comfortable salary, but you realize it's not the work you want to do. Well, you're not in a position where, you know, as a university student, they have to mm -hmm. make a quick decision and, and transfer into a new major, start spending the money. You could work for a good year or two, set aside enough money. Now you have tuition where you have money to live off while you take out student loans, whatever it be. Mm -hmm. So definitely having the financial backing, that's uh, essentially since I've been 16, I've been working pretty much nonstop. Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether it's full-time in the summers, part-time during school years, I've always held some sort of position. And, and really what that's helped me do is just kind of develop that backing. Wow. So as if I need to make mm -hmm. the change or if I, I need to have something to step out to, it's there to support me. So I sort of see that parallel with the things mm -hmm. you did and, and sort of the approach I would take. Mark, this is awesome. This, okay, so at 16, was the yum, lumber yard your first job? So, I mean, what was your first job? What was the first technically one? Technically soccer refing. Okay. Um, so you did that soccer really, refing. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then where did you go after that? So you did soccer refing. You tried that out. Yeah. So soccer refing was really only seasonal. I'd yeah. get a few games in May and June. Yeah. Uh, I wound up. So essentially at 16, my parents were like, Hey, you're not just chilling for the high school summers. You're, you're going to be working. <laughs> you got to earn money for university. You got to do it don't want you living in the basement yeah <laughs> uh so uh essentially uh you know at the time i thought it was a pretty tough job market knowing what i know now it was it was pretty ripe but uh you know when you're young though and you don't have anything on your resume it's it's actually really tough to get the first yeah. job and so uh i was trying all you know shopping malls near my house going in yeah. talking to you managers. tried everything right yeah and, and you uh, landed on soccer refing well so no so this is where i ended up going to the rona the lumber yard Oh, uh, okay. So, so soccer, soccer repping. Yeah, yeah. There soccer repping was, rep thing was through a personal connection in junior high, coming into high school now, working at the Rona Lumberyard. Uh, the boss was like, hey, we wow. know somebody. And uh, I really only envisioned that as a summer job, but, uh, you know, really thankful for the manager because he was just really flexible. Essentially, the deal was uh, it was a bunch of uh, university and high school age guys. Um, and sort of the deal was that we'd have enough that everyone would kind of stay on during the winter. A few would, would, would drop the job to focus on studies. Yeah. For the most part, you could, uh, you could pretty much, we had enough staff to arrange it so everyone could attend the classes, you know, have a social life and yeah. still make the job. And so for me, um, you know, that, that was a great gig to get on with. Yeah. What was after, the, was there something after the lumberyard at Rona? Uh, so after the lumberyard, uh, wow. That, so that actually would have taken me up into uh you guys that would be the next job i would take after the lumberyard and so i actually ran in tandem uh i didn't actually quit oh. the lumberyard until the first semester of second year i uh yeah. i finally said you know it's it's time to uh to step aside and and wow. with tutoring i became more involved obviously tutoring uh when you can set your own hours i mean that beats any kind of manager giving you favorable hours right yeah. like i can request and you can kind of honor my request but to a certain point i'm going to get unfavorable hours but with this if if it's something i'm not available obviously i can't take a lesson hey matt yeah mark you're not a sponsor here right so <laughs> you're yeah, not getting no. sponsored here but no I, I i feel so good that you say that because i think that's the best thing right where you know you you get some flexibility and it, it seems like you really really enjoyed um you know the tutoring and mentorship aspect as well yeah mm. i mean that's uh for me all oh, like so my first clients, uh, I started working in with uh, the summer of, I, I believe, or, well, no, so it was in the spring of uh, his mm -hmm. great tenure. Yep. And so really what I saw, I mean, 
I saw the same progression in myself in high school. Is coming into grade ten, uh, sort of not the best study habits in place. Um, really struggling because really the studying wasn't there. Trial and error. And so what's really been, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what's really been the payoff of the job though is is I've seen this in other students, but not to the degree of my first client where I've been with him, fortunate enough to have been with him now basically until the 12th year. And so right. seeing the progression year by year, semester by semester, seeing him learn and actually it's, you know, with the, the real uh, evolution, right? You're, yeah, you're the seeing evolution. the evolution. I yeah. mean, at a lumber yard, it's, it's the same thing in and out. You right. get customers, you serve them. There's some regulars who you build a rapport with, but for the most part, it's just a small window where you just do your best to serve them. Right. Right. With the tutoring, there's someone who you're directly accountable to. So if you have an off day at a retail job, mm -hmm. you maybe have rubbed the customer the wrong way, but they ended up probably still buying something. It's not the end of the world. Uh, going to tutoring now, it's, you know, it's a bit more demanding. You have to always be on top. It's remembering what you did last time, what they struggled with last time. Do we need to continue with that? Also, what's mm -hmm. now been thrown onto their plate uh, as their schooling progresses and developing that bond. Um, mm -hmm. but, you know, I tell you that work to put in is worth it when you see the progression in grades, the progression in study habits, and uh, most of all, the progression in maturity in my students. Uh, you know, that, that really is, um, uh, it's such a good feeling to see, you know, see them and to see the pride once they start achieving the results they want to. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say that's probably the best part of, of the mm -hmm. job is, is seeing the impact the work has on the students. Because sometimes when you're doing a job, you just feel like you're sort of a corporate capitalist cog. You know, you're just doing the bit to make someone a money. You're going to get some sort of wage. But here we see people that are paying for the service. And now we see the value paying off with yeah. what the results are and what the changes with the student are. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's, that's always, always awesome to see. I, I love how you worded that, Mark, because I think my mom's finally going to start seeing the intrinsic value <laughs> that I actually try to explain where there's no dollar amount that you can use to quantify that when someone and that someone being your student that you're working with or that younger brother or sister that you're working with, yeah. someone that truly looks up to you. And after they have a sense of accomplishment or they just really look at you for the best advice possible and you see them climb through the same hoops, right? That you've yeah. climbed before and you're like, hey, careful, there's shit on the ground. Don't step there, but you can step here, you know, like I've yeah. stepped in that before, <laughs> you know? And so it, you know, when you were talking about that, I think that's the same thing where it's like, it's a job that, you know, even to this day, I still tutor, right? And mentor on the ground and I feel like it's a job that when you go home at the end of the night you don't look at every two weeks and what that paycheck's going to be you almost go back and look at wow I feel good like when I sleep I know that I left everything on that floor that notebook or that person's house or like that person's in that person's life you know and so it's just something where, you know, that honestly, it's, it's how I got hooked onto it, right? Is like when that, that intrinsic value or that intrinsic satisfaction of happiness where I'm like, wow, I used to get paid probably like five times or six times this amount, right? Yeah. But this is a feeling that I've never gotten. It, it's like an inverse relationship, you know? Yes, yeah. the monetary side was, you know, with my corporate job, it was five or six times. But then the happiness that I was actually getting on this other side with um, the education world, right? Yeah, it was 10 times more. Right. And so, I mean, what's life all about, you know? Yeah. And I really doing what you love. I think a lot of people for them, what defines the happiness and the quality of night, uh, life um, in relation to their job is the value they create in the world. So obviously, if you feel as if you're just punching numbers into a spreadsheet and just only dealing with intangibles like data, uh, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes to see, you know, obviously your work is, even if you're back end, it supports a corporation that makes profits, yada, yada. Right. But when you can see directly like the changes in quality of life of a student who has going from low self-esteem because they're not achieving and there's pressure from their teachers and their parents, to them starting to grasp the concepts and, you know, 
just about every single student I've dealt with, when they start to learn things that they didn't understand, overcoming that roadblock, you can see the joy in their face. You can see the pride. And so yeah. to see that you're literally changing someone's life just as your job, it's like, you know, like you said, maybe the money's not there, right? Because the difference in this kid going through school, low self-esteem, uh, you know, doesn't get into a university program, maybe just sort of settles for low paying mm -hmm. job versus excelling in school going into you know a really good paying job that's quantifiable probably in a few hundred thousand dollars we 100%. don't see that what we see is the difference we make in the quality of life we're not necessarily comped for all the value we put into the world but the conversation is definitely i like the word used intrinsic mm -hmm. seeing the changes the maturities and the developments in these students on how how the service we offer affects them i think that's the real payout in this situation as opposed to monetary compensation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I a hundred percent agree with you. And do you, do you find that now that you've had a deeper relationship and obviously the relationship forms over time, right? That the students start telling you things or, you know, looking up to you or asking you things where they might not even open up to like their friends or, you know, their parents. Like, do you feel like you have that kind of altruistic relationship with them now? where you're, you're like that older brother that they I'm, talk to? I definitely, you feel that, you feel that bond, you feel that, that rapport. Um, you know, it, it's not necessarily always something expressed. Uh, I mean, I've had uh, one, one particular student I've had the, the fortune of working with over the past year is a big Star Wars fanatic. And so for him, it, I can directly see, uh, you know, at the end of the lesson, he always tries to, haggle me for a few minutes after the lesson's over to, to chat about uh, some Star Wars video games or what my favorite uh, Clone Wars episode, whatever it be. Um, so there I can see it directly sort of the rapport we're building. Uh, yeah. Other students, though, it's a bit more subtle. It's, it's a bit more discreet. Uh, yeah. You don't, you know, they don't, they won't necessarily say it, but it's, it's the confidence they put in you. Um, you know, when, a lot of the times, you know, parents, um, they're just as educated on the subject. They can't get through to the students um, because they don't relate to the subject. But when I'm able to take the subject and break it down into something they can relate to, whether it's pop culture references or sort of rewording it in a way that works with their style of learning, mm -hmm. the bond really, I, I think everyone, uh, it's just the fascination of humanity is that uh, we're always learning beings and we're always fascinated with knowledge. And we have such a brain that can, that can process and understand so much information, so many different aspects, and actually so many different ways. So, this, so really, I find the deepest bond is, is really built as sort of I'm sort of feeding them the knowledge, guiding that thirst for new information, for new understandings of the world, right? Because that's really what you study in school. Right. Mathematical laws of the world, the scientific laws of the world, the historical and social aspects of events that happened, that sort of thing, the humanities, the structure of the language you speak. And so when you can guide them to that understanding, um, you know, the opening really happens when, you know, you see them trying more, you're seeing them trying to understand it in the ways that you guys discuss things. Um, and that, like, again, it's the development you see. Sometimes Star Wars guy, it's, it's really noticeable. You can see the energy beaming. <laughs> Some students are a bit more introverted on um, it's, it's in the subtle way where they, you know, when you're doing an explanation, they top it off with, you know, they'll continue and they'll relate it to a point that they understand better. Mm -hmm. And when you see sort of the blending of, of knowledge and of learning between what you're explaining and then the student actually getting it, I think that's where sort of the big brother mentality starts to play into. For sure, for sure. And I like, I, I think I want to call this out as well. Like a lot of students that are introverted or extroverted, you know, I think introversion doesn't always get the stage or, you know, the platform or the time of day no, that they deserve. But no. I think people need to understand introversion or extroversion introverted, um, essentially, when they act, go through thoughts. They, ha they have a very strong mentality where they can actually process thoughts inside their heads. Whereas extroversion, you almost need a sounding board. Like I, I'll, I'll put it here, right? For as an extrovert, I can't really think through a lot of things unless I talk to a mark or I talk to, you know, A, B or C party where I'm like, hey, I'm thinking this, what do you think? And then when they're that sounding board, I get that extra little umph, right? Where I'm like, oh yeah, that makes sense. But then I, I want to give kudos to introverts where they're able to collect their thoughts without anyone, 
right? And be yeah. like, oh, this is a good idea. And I, as you were talking about that, I just want to talk about how I love, I, I sometimes wish I was, you know, the introvert where I could, you know, not have to rely on other people, right? Yeah. I'm so, I'm, I'm dependent on you, Mark, essentially <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be no one. <laughs> I'd yeah, be nowhere I, in I life. Mean, I'm, I'm definitely an extrovert myself. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, what I find is, um, really, this, this relates back to the sense of learning is that um, I need, I have a very specific way of viewing the world. And so I always think of things rationally. And so I, I try and come to conclusions and ideas on a rational basis. It's not just an idea popped into my head. It's good as bad, right? I kind of try and debunk it, place it in whether or not this is something I want to do. But that's all coming from the perspective, the mindset, the viewpoint that I've developed through my experiences. I really find it helpful to, to, like you say, sounding board, project that onto others, because what you'll find, it's kind of like uh, sediment going down the river, slowly building up and forming uh, a sedimentary rock is is layering on of different perspectives and different takes um, on ideas. And I I think definitely for introverts, um, it would be nice sort of, I think for them, what they can do is I don't I mean you again you can't quote they're they're the igneous rock (laughs) yeah they tend to be yeah more more sort of self process they also introverts I read tend to be more empathetic um, just because they have a better internal processing and understanding different perspectives so I think for them it's it's just something internalized that they can do themselves very efficiently um, and sort of consider I think for them it's easier to put themselves in other people's shoes and, and not just look at it from their emotions but okay you know, if, if you were mm-hmm. someone else presented in the same opportunity, uh, would you take it? Like, feasibly, is this a good idea, bad or not? Whereas right. with extroverts, we're, like you said, we're kind of reliant on our peers. We rely on the social aspect of humanity, sort of the process, our ideas to develop um, concrete plans. We'd so, be uh, useless without people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We'd be like just flailing around like, where am I going? Where am I going? Is this going? a good idea? Is it not? How, <laughs> yeah. how do I confirm? Talk you know? to me. Talk to me. Talk to me. You know? So Mark, okay. Obviously evolution learning is your favorite job. All right. Let's just get that off the chest. right? <laughs> but you know, you know, jokes aside. So after evolution learning, so that, that was like your, so within your first year, wow, you've had three jobs already. And then after evolution, learning, let's go back to that, right? So what, you've had a fourth job now? Okay, so um, from that point, so started on evolution learning in uh, March 2019. Uh, the summer of 2019 was uh, very exciting. I ended up working at the Business Development Bank of Canada. So I was uh, blessed enough to secure an, an office job. Uh, it wasn't all uh, glamorous, you know, obviously data entry, backside things what, what were you uh, doing there mark what was your position so i was on so for background this bdc business development bank of canada right. they're uh they're a crown corporation dedicated mm-hmm. to entrepreneurs so they do entrepreneurial loans right. uh, i was on the special accounts team so that's loans in distress loans in arrears uh when things don't necessarily go to plan so really i was right. helping process admin work uh, they had a lot of vacation they needed coverage before. So just an extra right. analyst, sort of like a junior analyst to assist in task completion. Uh, right. It was, you know, really awesome to develop that, that admin experience. Um, I mean, like I said, the office job, not at all times. Sometimes you think, man, it'd be really nice to be out and working in the sun. Um, but it was definitely something I wanted to get in the bag uh, if I could take it just to you have. want to try it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'll have that, that office experience because that definitely adds value to my resume moving forward if I want to pursue internships or, you know, mm-hmm. it, essentially you have to look at it as every single job you take. In some way, you need to find out what value that adds to you and how you can represent that on your resume to get a better next job. Love that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, and so uh, BDC, like, so you worked there and then did you, did you have another job after that now? So while that summer was pretty hectic, so I was tutoring a bit. So it was... Yeah tutoring, working at the bank, and then still at Rona at that time. Uh, so working three jobs, learned a lot that summer. Uh, you hustler. How to not, yeah. Wow. yeah, how to how to hustle, but how to know your boundaries and, and sort of when it becomes too much. Um, yeah. Come September 2019, uh, you know, it was, it was a four-month temporary position at the bank. So 
Great. Said my thank yous, wonderful team, uh, went my way. And then that was the same time I sort of pivoted away from working, trying to balance my Rona hours with my evolution hours, just focusing exclusively on evolution as, as a part-time gig while I, I go mm -hmm. through my schooling. Um, and as well as, you know, that's sort of when the students need it the most during the school year. Mm -hmm. uh, that sort of takes me through uh, to now. Uh, I'm, I'm a sales associate at uh, Barbecues Galore. So that's a, a, fifth, a fifth job. All yeah. right. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. my anticipations uh, pre-COVID um, was, was kind of trying to get on with uh, another type of BDC role, an internship. Uh, and, you know, there's, there were some uh, interviews prior to COVID. Um, I remember a few right as sort of, it was looking like, okay, we're starting to have a global pandemic on our hands. I had one or two last interviews, but sort of the, the notion was, uh, we're, not, we're not really too sure if, if the job's even going to go ahead. And mm -hmm. so, unfortunately, I ended up in a situation where COVID was ongoing. I knew there was going to be uh, Trudeau checks being written out at, at some point. I was like, do I, do I want to sit around all summer and, and just uh, go on CERB or SESB? Or, you know, do I kind of want to try and find something to do, right? Something to do with my time. And so really what it was is just going on Indeed, you know, realizing, you know, there's not too, too many internships. Uh, finding businesses that have stayed open during the pandemic. And so it was, it was a good 40, maybe 50 Indeed applications later. Barbecue place called me back and they're like, hey, I want to come in for an interview. They were the first one to spring on that. And uh, once they offered the position, I was like, yeah, you know, uh, sales is something I didn't have on my resume. And like I said, every single position, whether or not it's where you want to be, you need to find something, a transferable skill to take away for the next position. So I saw this as a great opportunity to really develop my business acumen and, and to have sales experience. And so it's, it's been a blast. I mean, uh, as our listeners probably know, there's not a whole lot to do. Uh, with COVID. So a lot of consumers have been spending a lot more money on their backyards. Mm -hmm. So uh, to go in and uh, just sort of be tossed into a, actually a really hectic uh, sales environment on a product I honestly didn't really know a whole lot about before starting. Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's just been fun. It's, you know, just been in the trenches, um, selling to people, talking to people, sort of learning how to interact with people better, refining my business techniques. So that's, that's kind of where I've gotten up to now. I guess, uh, yeah. We Mark, you know what, Mark, you five. know what, it's five jobs. This is crazy. Like, you know, what's so admirable, the fact that you had the option to sit there and collect a check for $2,000, right from the government of Canada during COVID. And you looked at that yeah. and you're like, uh, no, I'd rather work every day and make a little bit less than that or a yeah. little bit more. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, wow. You know, like, it's it's admirable because a lot of the times at least what i know there's a lot of people collecting that check and they're like you know what i'm gonna enjoy the summer and decide later i guarantee you and i assure you that 80 percent of the people if they had the option to do what you did there they would be like you know what i'm gonna enjoy my summer you know have my drinks whatever enjoy the barbecue do all that and collect my two thousand dollars and i'll decide later right I have, you know, I have yet to verify and source that 80% that I'm yeah, uh, yeah. alluding to, but I feel like, let me, let me say this, it might not be 80%, but I assure that or feel confident that more than half of the people would decide to collect that check, you know, instead of just doing what you're doing. And I think it's admirable. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, really what it came down to, uh, you know, obviously uh, checks for free, that's, that's easy money. Um, and, and, and working eight hours a day uh, is, is not easy money in contrast to a government check. What really came down to is, is uh, sort of everyone was going to be sort of in the same boat, right? There wasn't going to be great opportunities for jobs. You weren't, I mean, some people still uh, were, were fortunate enough to, I mean, my brother's one, he's working at a big oil and gas producer uh, and, you know, he's, he's had his summer position go through. Um, but for the most part, a lot of them got canceled. So it was sort of like, okay, well, so now you're given an opportunity. And, and really, if you look at resumes, um, this is something with employment, is it, it really is a story. You put dates on there. So chronologically, you see, you're in, okay, so you were, this is education. You were in high school. You're working this job. You took a year break because you did some traveling and did an exchange program. Okay. And then you got this job when you went back to university, right? It tells the story. So regardless of who you are, that space needs to have something in there on your resume. And so, 
I mean, it's, yeah, sure. It is understandable if, if you didn't, you know, I'll be honest, it's, it's a tough job economy. I'm really blessed to have gotten the barbecue job. Not everyone is able to, to get a job, you know, if, if you have lack of experience, sure. maybe uh, this isn't necessarily the easiest time, but really what it is, is finding you got to have something you got to have done your best. It's, it's a trash time for everyone, but just, it's really yeah. about finding what's the best thing I can do to fill that slot. If, Maybe it wasn't a job. I have friends, some friends that are taking uh, computer programming language courses uh, through the UFC. They're like, you know, the summer's a wash. Uh, I'm just gonna, you know, keep on my part-time uh, retail job. But uh, to add that value into, into my resume or my profile, I, I need to be doing something productive. And so I think for me, that, that really is what it came down to is like, you know, I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably not too self-disciplined that, uh, you know, to, to maybe get, a good workout going or learn a new language on my own. I would need some sort of structure to guide that. And so I thought, you know, uh, to gain business experience through mm -hmm. a sales job, that, that really is a perfect opportunity to make the best of, of a crappy wow. summer. Mark, five jobs and you're honestly barely in your 20s, all right? And like, I <laughs> yeah. think this episode, we definitely have to thank your parents and your two brothers for just raising such an amazing person here and i'm talking about you mark right obviously hey, but like you. i think we owe it to them because they, oh, they definitely. did some they did some amazing things right and put it in put it this way you also put in that hard work which is amazing and you know before you know mark before we wrap up the episode i want to ask you two more questions here the first the first one being that mark seguin as i like to summarize it now you're this animal this animal that just like works five jobs in like less than five years if that okay this yeah. animal that just like crushes jobs would rather you know there's a free meal that's handed to you and you're like no i'd rather work for it myself right yeah and and by the free meal i, I i'm referring to the check right that free yeah, check the from the government yeah. the serb the two thousand dollars and then now you're here to present day so we walked through this whole loop and I guess the question I want to ask you now is, Mark, what is next for you? Like, what does the evolution or what does the road, you know, to your independence, to your story look like now um, from, what, from what you can tell me now? Yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is honestly a great question. Uh, really, what I'm trying to get back on track with is, is think some kind of internship role uh you know with with the transition i mean credit to universities it's it's a tough situation they're in um mm -hmm. but i i just really don't vibe with the online learning situation like i i need the in-person interactions you know need lectures uh you know um to go into school it's i'm i'm really trying not to complete the 2020 2021 year in, in class rather in in the field in an industry uh internship I mean, right. obviously, if it doesn't happen, I, I have no issues uh, completing courses. But really, what it's what it's looking like from here on out is uh, I just got confirmed into my computer science minor. So really, the role I'm trying to take is is the data business analytics major combined with the computer science. Uh, right. it's, it's a bit of it's a bit of a uh, regret of not pursuing my dad and my brother's computer science uh, career because you know looking at it statistically, that is that is a booming industry, you know, computers and automation and, and the whole sort and programming. Um, but really what I saw is something bigger than just that general is data management and data usage. Um, so that's why I chose the data analytics because I think now, especially in finance, there's so, so, so much money in the data. You know, yeah. it's something Facebook pays. It's every big company wants your data because they're going to use that. They're going to analyze it. They have the ways, they have the methods to figure out how to better sell it to you. Yeah. So really what I'm trying to do moving forward is sort of progress into some kind of role uh, as a business data analyst, something to do maybe with the data management company. Mm -hmm. uh, something though, as an industry, uh, you know, as an Albertan uh, born and raised, not only was there the pressure of engineering, but the oil and gas industry. You know, uh, a lot of people, whether you're in business, engineering, sciences, a lot of people go into that industry. Uh, you know, I, I got to be completely honest. It's it's a part of our lives. Consumption, 
Um, but you know, in terms of environmentalism, it's not the best, you know, we have to admit that, but mm -hmm. it's something we got to deal with now. What I want to see as opposed to green energy, I really am a big proponent of nuclear technology. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's, it's a bit underappreciated. I think we could definitely develop it. You look at countries like France, they're tapping into it, you know, since the eighties. So I think for me, that's, it's, it's a space that doesn't really exist in Canada right now. Right. I definitely right. think though, logically, that's going to evolve with the conversation. I mean, it's been a conversation. Climate change has been around since, you know, the 20th century. That's, that's something, whether you deny it, whether you support it, that's always been a conversation and that's obviously going to progress. And we've seen it progress our oil and gas and energy industry. So I think that's going to open up a space in nuclear technology. And as, mm -hmm. as a big believer in that, I, I would hope, to eventually move into a role within that industry because that's something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so dream job, business data analyst uh, for a nuclear technology firm. I think that is sort of where I'm working towards. Um, so a few internships here, mm -hmm. that computer science minor, uh, finishing out the business analytics major, sort of progressing. It's probably, you know, it's it's definitely not going to be at this rate a four-year degree. I'm probably aiming for a five and a half, maybe six-year degree. Um, but, you know, to come out as well-rounded and as cultured as possible to adapt to a changing environment is I think that's that's kind of where I'm trying to go with this. Hey, Mark, with the, with the level of hustle and grit that you have, honestly, you're going to be that person that you want to be. And I have no doubts. And we'll look back at this episode in five years or three years. And we'll be like, I said, I was going to do it. It's and look good at me we now. got it on film, man. It's good. Yeah. We're gonna be, uh, <laughs> and now I'm here. <laughs> yeah. You know, it'll be, it'll be interesting to look, look yeah. back in five years, uh, sort of, you know, like the, the whole 80, 20 concept. This is now the outlining the 80, I want to go. Obviously it's, you know, probably not going to produce an exact result as I'm describing it now. But to, you know, in the future, hopefully look mm -hmm. at something similar or something considering the situation then, something as intended. Uh, looking back and sort of saying, you know, like there was value in, in making out that plan because whether it directly led me or indirectly led me, it led me to where I am today. Love that. Love that. And so, Mark, last question for you. And I, I, I really love asking this question because every answer is the right answer here. And the question is, in Mark Seguin's eyes, what is his definition of success? What does success really mean for Mark? Wow. I, uh, I thought, you know, a podcast be light and easy, you know, pretty, pretty straightforward questions, but that, that's, uh, that's a tough one. That's a big one. It's, um, it, you, know, you, you I, do too I, many I, things, Mark. That's why, you know, five jobs in a year, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I, uh, I would define success as, uh, as, as supporting yourself. I mean, it's, it's no secret, regardless of a fantasy world, you want to be or you're trying to make, you have to earn a wage to support your lifestyle there's bills to pay constantly so i think success is surviving in the sense of meeting your financial obligations while pursuing something that either a you're passionate about or b something aligns with sort of your morals and your values so um, whether it be you're pursuing a career in uh the fields you really are passionate about and really enjoy and are knowledgeable about or maybe you're taking a humanitarian altruistic approach and you're working this not necessarily in a role that pays the best or mm. necessarily the most desirable jobs that you're completing, but it's something I give back to society. I really think it's, it's just at the end of the day, having something to say, looking back on successes, I've covered my own, my own bases. Uh, I've been able to do things on my own terms. Uh, you know, it's, I don't define success as material success. I mean, you'll realize once you, once you hit that hundred dollar savings target as a kid, uh, you know, you realize then a hundred bucks when you get to 16, not that much money and progressively. And especially once you get into paying tuition, a right. <laughs> hundred bucks, that's barely half of my textbook. So to, to base it on something <laughs> tangible or materialistic, yeah. I, I think is a bit, a bit ridiculous. And it's mm -hmm. more so just doing something to support yourself and having a positive contribution to society or sort of having a contribution to society that aligns with the moral values you hold close to your character. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mark, that is a beautiful answer. Mark Seguin, everybody. And Mark, I really want to say thank you. Thank you so much. Not only for being a part of the evolution learning community, but for you just teaching me so many things today. Like through this conversation, I've learned a lot. I've had a lot of fun. I really hope you've had a lot of fun, but really thank you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. We're so blessed to have you. No, you know, Sam, it's uh, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, you know, it was, it was a great opportunity today to just, uh, you know, I, I really think podcasts are such a revolutionary thing now because it just allows people as opposed to presenting information like a newsreel or a video or something, it allows dialogue. And so I, I really think uh, I have to thank you as well, because, you know, these are some things, you know, always in the back of my mind, but I don't have the experience to share them with people uh, in my everyday job. You know, if, if I try to impart financial uh, responsibility upon customers at the barbecue place, it probably wouldn't go down too well, you know, um, yeah. but, you know, to be able to, to have a platform, to have, to have a space where I can sort of put out messages, uh, positive messages, messages mm -hmm. that, you know, like you said, people, so they don't step in the same puddles that I stepped in so they can take something, like I said, learn. You have to take what you know today, you have to process it and you think, how can I apply this so I'm in a better position tomorrow? And, you know, I think opportunities like this are, are the great opportunity to that. So, uh, you know, I really thank you, Sam, for having me today. And for, uh, you know, keeping me a part of the evolution learning family, you know, that, that really has been uh, such a blessing to have, mm -hmm. uh, not only as a, as a consistent job year after year, but uh, as an opportunity, like I said, just to, to contribute and have a positive net benefit on society, you know, in, in the form of the give back with our students, our parents and the community. So I, I thank you, Sam. Mm -hmm. Mark, you're family and we're family together, all right? So until next time, thank you so much. Mark Zeguin, everybody. Oh, th thank you for a great episode. Me, I mean, take care, eh? You take care. Cheers. Cheers, buddy. Thank you for tuning in to another episode on the Evolution Learning Show. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to like and share this episode with your network or subscribe to the channel. You can also find out more about us on www.evolutionlearning.org. See you in our next episode, and until next time, take care of yourself and each other.